Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Pods Moving and Storage Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. George Camel, Ramsey personality, host of the uh, extremely popular new George Camel YouTube show, and uh, also the podcast called, well, at least he's a co-host of it, called a smart money happy hour and you can check both of them out he and rachel cruz do that one together the phone number here as we talk to you about your life and your money is 888-825-5225 josh starts off this hour in idaho falls idaho hey josh how are you doing great how are you doing dave better than i deserve what's up so a question for you my wife and i have a household income of just over hundred thousand, and we're completely through baby steps one through three and I'm wondering how, with the current house market, we don't have a home, are saving up for a home, how do baby steps four and five change for us? Why would they change? Well, we are just saving up for a home and working towards that down payment. We're almost ready for the down payment. Okay. Have you ever ta- heard us talk about the thing we call baby step 3B? I have heard a little bit, yes. Okay. That's what you're talking about, I think. Okay. So you finish your emergency fund at three. That is the point at which you would begin to save for your home. And some people push pause and don't do four and don't start saving for retirement until they build their fully, until they get their house down payment. Some people Mm -hmm. save for a house while they're putting something in retirement up to 15% for baby step four. So you can do either one or both somewhere in there. So how long is this going to take to save up your down payment? Uh, we're, thinking, so we're, we're thinking mid next year, we're going to have uh, a little bit larger down payment than is required. And we're doing 8% of our household income into Roths right now. Okay. And so while doing 8%, you'll still have that down payment by mid next year. Yeah, we're putting away 8% into the Roths and about 40% of savings just goes away into CDs until we're ready for a down payment. That's fabulous, Josh. Well done. Yeah, that's what we would call baby step 3B. So 3B okay. is all of your savings goes into um, into your house down payment fund up or down to a little bit less, a little bit less, a little bit less than all because you're putting some or up to 15% into retirement. So you're putting eight into retirement and you're still going to make your down payment goals. Doesn't change a thing. It's exactly what I would do. Have at it. Okay. And then would you hold off at all until interest rates come down or just when we get that down payment ready? No, buy a house when you're ready. Okay. Because here's the thing. If interest rates come down after you buy the house, refinance. House prices aren't coming down. We've not seen substantial drops in house prices ever in the real estate market except during the 2008 debacle. And we're not going to see them now. We've told you this for two years because we've still got a shortage of housing. There's not enough inventory. Too many buyers chasing too few items causes price to maintain stability or go up. So house prices are going to be going up, and I wouldn't sit around and watch the house prices go up while I'm waiting on interest rates to go down. Bad plan. I don't time the stock market or the real estate market. Exactly. Both both involve some risk. And The 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 only time I would time the real estate market is if I can't find a deal when I'm buying investment property. And then wait. Because the market's like white hot and there is no deals. I am just don't buy unless I get a good, good deal. Period. I do not buy investment property unless I steal it. Period. I want to get a great buy on investment property. Your money's made at the buy on that. But as far as your personal residence goes, buy when you're ready, which is when you're debt free, have your emergency fund in place and have saved your down payment. Yeah. And I get interest rates have got people freaked out because, you know, it's hundreds of dollars more in your payment. And they're going, well, I need to wait. The problem, like you're saying, Dave, is those same people are going to call us and say, Dave, I waited and now the home price is 100000 more than it was. Well, and there's no guarantee interest rates come down. I mean, we just saw the the Fed just... What if you sat around and waited and they went to 10? Yeah, they just raised the rates again. So we just don't know. Yeah, 1978, September, I got my real estate license. I was 18. That was the year interest rates went from nine and three quarters to 10% for the very first time ever. And if it did it then, and then it went on up to 18 before it came back down, and it took it a decade to do that reversal, to go on up and then back down... Uh, if it did it then, why can't it do it now? I mean, I don't know. These these bozos continue to screw with this. They're, they're going to mess it up. I mean, so I wouldn't be sitting around waiting on the outside environment to get you ready. You get ready, 
strike while the iron's hot. Jocelyn is, and get a good real estate agent to help you make good, clear decisions. Jocelyn is with us in Miami. Hey, Jocelyn, how are you? Hey, so good. So nice to be able to talk to you guys. You too. What's up? So I have a family quinceanera trip coming up next June. A a family what? Uh, um, Like a think of a sweet 16, quinceanera. Quinceanera. Okay. My my Spanish um, is limited to my hillbilly. So, (laughs) okay, I got you. Sweet 16. um, Yes, think of a sweet 16. Um, it's it's on a cruise, and um, I'm currently on baby step two. I have 60K in debt, and we've been working on, you know, paying it down as quickly as possible, but um, this trip is coming up, and everyone's kind of reserving it, and I don't know how who, to go who is, who's, t- who's turning 16? My niece, my first niece. Oh, and you're supposed to yeah, go on a so, cruise because she's turning 16. Yes. It's a tradition. It, yeah, every I guess. Every daughter... It's a great tradition. I love it. it For is, rich it people. Is, honestly. That's stuff rich people ought to do right there. Yeah. Not broke people. It wasn't a tradition in my house growing up. We didn't have that kind of mm-hmm. money. I never saw the ocean till I was 15. Yeah. So how much is this cruise going to cost? Um, It's going to be around... It would be around probably eight thousand. Oh it my goodness! Cheaper, but I... <laughs> Where are y'all going? Around the world well, and back? What I didn't I didn't choose this cruise. Okay, I'm just trying to you know see how to go best. What's the best way to go about it? Because I understand it's expensive, I and I understand I'm just, trying I, to it, pay off. Are you? Debt. But you're not going to be out of debt by then. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's, what do you make a year? Ninety thousand. Okay. And how much debt have you got, hon? 60. And how old are you? 30. Okay. Well, you're 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 a big girl. You get to make your own decisions. You don't have to do what Dave and George say. You can yeah. do whatever you want to do, right? I can tell you what mm-hmm. Dave and Sharon Ramsey would have done if we were in your situation. We would have wished okay. our niece good luck and have a great time. We're not going to be able to join you because we're broke people. That's what we would have yeah. told them. But you're not going to okay. do that. You're not going to do that. I can tell by talking to you already. You're going on the cruise. You, have, you There's no way you could tell these people no. You, you don't have it within your being. You can't You can't just smile and say no. Nope. $8,000 for a 16-year-old. Lord Jesus, buy her a car. And when you don't have the money, it's going to compound the debt problem. You're going to have to put her on a credit card. could have bought her a really nice car. I mean, and she's going to go in debt for her student loans for her vac- for when she goes <sighs> to school, when she turns 18, right? I'm going to just, I'm going to have a small calf here. This is The Ramsey Show. If you're like most people, your home is your most valuable asset. And when you want to make improvements, it can feel like everything costs too much or takes too long. But something as simple as custom window coverings from Blinds.com can completely change your space and add value to your home. We've recommended Blinds.com for over a decade, so you know you can trust them. From blinds, drapes, and shutters to motorized shades, they make it easy and affordable to upgrade your entire home, and their team is ready to help with everything, from design consultation to measuring and installation. Plus, there are never any misleading quotes or hidden fees. Everything's backed by their 100% satisfaction guarantee, and shipping is always free. See why Blinds.com is the number one online retailer of custom window coverings. Go to Blinds.com now and save 40% off selected products. Visit Blinds.com today for more info.
George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host. Open phones at 888-825-5225. You jump in. We'll talk about your life and your money. So the uh, feds uh, raised the rate again, another quarter of a point. Um, How many times have they done this now? Well, they're just not smart. You know, because the economy is just booming, so we should definitely do things to screw it up and slow it down. We can't have that. And, of course, they want to get all the pain out of the way before there's a presidential election. So they're getting all this crap out because people will forget to be mad two years from now. Now's the time. This is the 10th time, it says, that they've raised the uh, rates. And all in a process to slow down inflation that was not caused by an overheated economy. It was caused by an underheated supply chain caused by Fauci. So, um, so attack the wrong problem, you get the wrong solution. Yeah, you just should have fired him long before you, he finally got around to quitting, and then you'd have been better off. When you have math done by the medical community, apparently they're not good at it. So this is how what we get into. So anyway, yeah, yeah. What does so, it mean? Anyway, let, let me try to explain what I'm rambling about and mumbling about here. So the problems with inflation were caused by supply chain disruption. Supply chain disruption is defined as a shortage of goods. The shortage of goods, anytime there's a shortage of anything, it causes the prices to go up. Remember toilet paper? And so uh, there's a rush on it and prices go up and people price gouge and everything else. There's a shortage on oil because you turn the pipeline off because you have an electric thing going or whatever it is you got going a green thing you got going, and you turn the pipeline off, and you shut down the supply of gasoline. Gasoline prices go up. So the bumper, the little sticker on there that says, I did that with Biden. Yes, he did. Uh, he did not do the other parts of inflation, but they were caused by simply Fauci. Because when you shut down all the factories and they don't produce stuff, you create a shortage of stuff. And the shortage of stuff causes the prices to go up. Oh, by the way, when you declare an entire segment of the economy as non-essential, you're not essential. Talk about freaking insulting. How would you just like to be called non-essential? How, how do you recover from that psychologically? You're non-essential. I'm essential, but you're not essential. That's the ultimate in snobbery. But anyway, we did do that, right? Yes. And uh, so if you're non-essential, then you create, and then when you want everybody to come back to work, well, they go, screw you. I'm non-essential. I'm not coming back to work. By the the way, you're giving me lots of money to stay at home, so I'm not going to come back to work. Screw you. I'm not going to wait your tables. I'm not going to make your beds at the hotel, and I'm not going to stock your shelves at Target. Oh, well, what if we paid you $20 an hour instead of $10 an hour? Oh, then I would come back. Okay, then you came back at double the rate almost what you were paid pre covid Oh, by the way, that cost of that loaf of bread has in it the labor to put the loaf of bread on the shelf, which is now double because of the shortage created by quarantine. So even labor was supply chain disrupted. All of that created this artificial inflation that would have smoothed out on its own if the freaking Fed had stayed out of it. But instead, they decide they're going to slow the economy down because it's white hot, which it's not. It was just going through a burp. Rat through a snake trying to get itself straightened out after the quarantine created by Fauci. So now we have a Federal Reserve that is uh, trying to screw in a Phillips head screwdriver with a hammer. And they keep ratcheting this They're using this the thing wrong up. tool. So they're, they're trying to ratchet this interest rate up to calm people down. But people don't seem to be stopping their spending either. We're at record high consumer debt across the board. Well, they slowed the real estate market down. Which sure. uh, didn't help a ton, it seems. No, it's still we still have a shortage of housing compared to the supply of buyers. But um, anyway, so bottom line is uh, the Fed is stupid, and they're trying they're trying to In use nineteen seventies and nineteen eighties monetary policy to slow down a different type of inflation that was not created by the interest rate environment, and they use trying to use the interest rate environment. So they're literally using the wrong tool on the economy. They really are using a hammer on a screw and it's not, it doesn't work. So this is what you're dealing with, but Hey, the Island of Misfit Toys continues their parade in Washington. So you can just count on it. <sighs> so we're going to see rates go up on all types of debt. This is well, the fed rate to be clear is nothing to do directly to the mortgage rate. Okay. Mortgage rates created by the bond market. So whatever the bond market does is what the mortgage rates are going to do. The Fed rate is what banks borrow from other banks for. And so other banks, one bank is now borrowing from another bank if it needs some money at a quarter percent higher. 
So their cost of money is higher. So anything that bank does is going to be upcharged. They pass so, it down to the consumer. So they're going to jack up your your auto rates, credit auto cards. borrowing rates, credit card rates, uh, personal loan rates, student loans, home equity loan rates, anything that that a bank product that's going into the market. Now mortgages are not a bank product. Mortgages are a bond market product. So they're not directly tied. Uh, but mortgage rates, the, the bond market has kind of followed along with this particular set of increases. So that's why we have higher mortgage rates while we've had Fed increases. So not to panic, but just more general disgust with the incompetency of what the economic incompetency of what these people call themselves as leaders. And it doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. Stupid is just stupid. There okay? is silver lining, Dave, though. Interest rates for savings accounts also will get a bump, which is good for those saving up for their down payments or their emergency funds. Yeah, so let me ask you this, okay? Not life-changing. 1980, I'm in college. Rates are, uh, mortgage rates were 17%. Wow. 1980, 1981, 17%. Um, and my grandpa, in his uh, at that time in his 70s, uh, was loving it. Because he had CDs and money market accounts down at the old savings and loan that were paying 11%. Wow. He had a savings account. CD rates, 11%. He was loving it. He thought it was just fancy because he didn't have any debt, and he wasn't going to go get a mortgage. And he was just cashing in on these high interest savings accounts. So, it, But my, my question, George, is, is the trade-off worth it? I mean, would you, do you really want 11% savings rates? And the trade-off is you got an 18% mortgage rate. Mm. Nope. Don't want that. Not good. Not good. Not healthy for anybody. Um, sorry that your savings account sucks at 1% back when we had 3% mortgage rates, but 3%, 4%, 5% mortgage rates were Because a good it hurts thing. the economy more than it helps your bank it's account. It's just stupid on steroids. And the banks are cleaning up. They're cleaning up when this happens. Either way, they're making their money. You, you can count on the banks making their money, and you can count on the politicians drawing their paycheck. Where if we had those people paid based on their effectiveness, they'd all be at the in the bread line. But um. But then who's going to pass that? Because they're not going to do that. Well, they're who's not. Gonna they pass can't even pass term limits to send themselves home when they can't. <laughs> Sonny is with us. Sonny's in St. Louis. Sonny, give us some sunny news. Hey, it's always sunny where I'm at. Dave. <laughs> I hear you, brother. <laughs> yeah, but what, what I'm calling about is uh, me and my wife, when we got married, she had a bunch of savings. I had um, a little bit of debt, and then she had about mm, probably like 72000 in savings. And we bought some property from her parents that we intend to build on, and she put uh, 25% or 20% down on it. And now she has more in savings. We still have some debt, but I feel like it's unfair for me to ask her to pay on our debt with that money if a lot of the debt is mine that I brought into our marriage. Not that not that we're not together on it, but you're you're married, she, right? Yeah. Yeah. So if she gets cancer, is it unfair like for you to, to take care myself. of her? What's that? I'm sorry. If she gets cancer, is it unfair for you to take care of her? No, of course not. Well you didn't cause it. Not your That's fault. Right. I'm trying to use your own logic back on you. Yeah, I got you. No, I, I yeah. yeah. In I sickness down there. and in health, for richer, for poorer. And the old Book of Common Prayer continues the vow, and it says, Unto thee all my worldly goods I pledge. This is called oneness. Right. It's called unity. So all guilt is set aside. She got you with a package. You got her with a package. You got yeah. all the crap, and you got all the awesomeness. It's all in one package. <laughs> yes, sir. Would it be fair, though, for me to... It's say fair for you to combine all of your income, all of your assets, and all of your liabilities, and then begin to work the baby steps together. That's completely fair. You got married, dude.
Well, you've all played the telephone game. The first person whispers a message to the second person who whispers it to the third and so on around the table until the original message has completely changed. Multiply that confusion by a hundred if you run a business with different software systems that don't talk to each other. That's why there's NetSuite by Oracle. In the early days of Ramsey, we were using different systems for all of our business units. We needed one single source for accurate data. NetSuite was the software we used to optimize and take us to the next level. NetSuite gave us the visibility into all of our numbers so that we could communicate across departments and plan ahead better. And as we grew, it scaled with us. NetSuite worked for Ramsey and it will make a difference for your business too. Join the more than 34,000 customers who trust NetSuite to help make them smarter and make better decisions and level up their operations. To learn more, get a free product tour at netsuite.com slash Ramsey. That's netsuite.com slash Ramsey. If you're new to all this Ramsey stuff, uh, go to RamseySolutions.com. Click on Get Started. It's a free service that we have. It'll start teaching you some of the vernacular, some of the words we use around here, like baby steps and debt snowballs and all that kind of stuff. Also, it'll kind of teach you where you are. You take a little, a little assessment. We'll show you right where you are and then what your natural next steps are. It's completely free. We're not trying to trap you into something. We're just trying to help you. So click Get Started at RamseySolutions.com. Yolanda's with us in Atlanta. Hi, Yolanda. How are you? I'm good, Dave. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Well, I am calling because um, I have a life estate, or my mom has a life estate, and I am the we, Manderman is what it's called, I guess, when I looked it up. The, and the Remainderman, got, yes. The, yes, the Remainderman. And I got concerned because I've heard you talk many times when people call in about having property um, wheeled or whatever to them prior to the person's death mm -hmm. and, the, and the tax um, ramifications that that involves. You got it. That's what's going on. So, you're now the owner of the property. Well, my mom is still alive. No, no, no. you're the owner of the okay. property. She has right. rights to stay in the property as long as she's alive. That's a life estate. Okay. But it's already so, dated to you. Can Should I reverse it? Can I reverse it? How long has it been going on? Um, I think it occurred in 20, I want to say 2018. I'm not sure. I think it was. Who did it? That. Um, my mom did it. I know. Is Me it and my mom. With an attorney or? Yes, with an attorney. Okay. Um, I would check your tax pro and ask okay. them and check an attorney and see. I don't know, since it's been sitting there so long, if you can reverse that or not. If you did it last month, you could just flip the paperwork back over, and I wouldn't think of anything about it. But it's been sitting there for three or four years now, five years now, and I don't know. Honestly, uh, and I would make sure I had Georgia law, which is what's going to apply here. Well, I assume that's it, where, where, where's the house? Florida. Oh, Florida law. Ooh, mm -hmm. and Florida's got some wicked, weird real estate. Well, also awesome. uh, Florida, Texas, California in the column of weird real estate laws. And so, uh, they're actually weird. Good. Most of the time, but okay. not always. And it's cause it's an income tax free state. There's no state income mm -hmm. tax there. So, uh, right. yeah. So check out, uh, yeah, I think I'd talk to a tax pro, talk to an attorney, and if you can undo it, I think if you run the calculation on it, you're going to see that it's going to benefit you to undo it. Because basically, okay. when you sell the house after her death, you're mm -hmm. going to be paying capital gains on everything over what she paid for it. Oh, no. Because the okay. house was gifted to you, you got her, her basis okay. for tax purposes. Double check my tax advice because I'm not always right, but on this one I'm right. 
Okay, let me ask you one other question if you have time. Mm-hmm. Should I go back to the attorney who set it up? Would that be best? After you've talked to a tax pro and you're armed with knowledge. Okay. Because otherwise he or she may give you the arrogant attorney answer like, I'm never wrong because I have a law degree, which, of course, we all know is absolute horse crap. (laughs) I agree with you there. Yeah. So. Go ahead. Yeah. In other words, you need to go back to this attorney after you talk to the tax pro and go, look, you're going to cost me with this. An extra forty, fifty thousand bucks in taxes. What's the property worth, by the way? The property is worth three forty seven. And when my what? mom bought the house, when my mom and dad had the house built, um, the house was built for forty k. Okay, so you got a three hundred k gain, give or take, upon her death, and um, that is a gain you would not have to pay taxes on if she willed it to you. Now that it's okay. already in your name, you're probably going to have to pay. If I got my if I got my answer right here, uh, as a remainder, I'm almost positive this is true. So three fifteen, so fifty thousand dollar swing. You're gonna pay. Uh-uh. You're gonna pay fifty grand in taxes because they screwed uh-uh. this up. So yeah, I'm gonna go talk to my tax pro, verify that Dave is not crazy. Okay, which is possible, but um, it's possible I'm crazy. It's also possible I'm wrong. But, you know, this is going downhill fast, George. But Well, it's, it's like going to a whole life salesman going, I want to undo this policy. They're going to try to talk you out of it most likely. So that's well, why I want you know, You go, look, because of this, my basis is going to be this. Right. And I'm going to have to pay taxes of 46000 bucks because you did this. Instead, right. she could have just stayed in her own stinking house and left it to me in the will, and I wouldn't have had to pay these taxes. Because right. you get a, you get what's called a stepped up basis upon her death, your your basis becomes what the value of the house is at market value at the time of the house at the time of death. So if she dies and the house is worth three sixty, you sell it for three sixty, you have zero gain. You put a hundred percent of those dollars in your pocket. The way it is now, you're going to pay taxes on everything over what she paid for it, or about three hundred thousand dollar gain. So okay. it's just a, it's just dumb, but yeah. But um, double check all of that. And if it's true, then talk to this attorney about undoing it. He or she doesn't want to undo it. I'm talking to another attorney about undoing it. If I can pull that off five years into this deal in Georgia, I don't know if you can or not. You may be stuck. I hope I'm not in Uh, Florida. It's not the end of the world. It's not the end of uh, Florida. I keep saying Georgia, but yeah, you're in Georgia. (laughs) She's in Florida. Yeah, I'm in Georgia. Yeah, she's in Florida. I'll get my story straight eventually. So a lot of people do life estates because they're trying to avoid probate. Is that the main reason? Yes, or they just don't know the basics of this basic tax thing we're talking about here. And it's a very basic, it's not a, if it's, if it's more than basic about taxes, I don't know it because I don't know anything about taxes. I, there's about four or five tax things I know. This just falls into the heading and one of them I know. Uh, and it's cause I've run into it on different things lots of times over the years, but yeah. And it's just kind of, it's like, um, <sighs> I call it street law, where someone says, yeah, we're just going to give Bubba the house while I'm still alive. That way, sister won't get it. You know, that kind of crap. And this is the, that's just street law. And it's street law, meaning you think you can just do whatever the flip you want, and there's no tax implications mm-hmm. to it. Yeah, you can give Bubba the house, but there's gift tax implications and or capital gains implications when you give Bubba the house. Or in this case, not Bubba, but Yolanda. But yeah, but I mean, it's, uh, and Less sometimes, sometimes people do that to keep, it's not as much an estate planning thing. It's they somehow get in their head that the government's going to get more oh. if they let it happen through a will. And the government gets less if you let it happen through a will. Even if it's a probate, even if it's a state where the probate tax is a little high. Yeah, probate is still, still cheaper than, than that tax implication. Yes, yeah, less than capital gains tax. But there's not, a, I don't think there's a state that has a higher probate than capital gains. Mm. So it's more about control and lack of legal and tax knowledge, uh, usually, than it is some kind of sophisticated argument that, um, that you're there. But you can, I mean, you can use a life estate if you want to. It's okay, yeah, especially if you're not planning on selling the property. Like if it's a family farm and you were going to just pass it down, 100% it's going to be generational, we're just not going to be selling it, then sure, you know, that's fine. You go ahead and do a life estate, and the next generation keeps farming it, and the, the old people get to stay in the farmhouse, you know, and for a life estate, that kind of stuff. That's Lots of people do that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, but, but 
again, it, 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 in Yolanda's case, it's handcuffed her big time as to what she can do with this property someday when, God forbid, her mother passes, but we're all going to pass. So, mm. Was there a right way to do it, would you say? If you want to do it, do a trust if you want to avoid probate. Is there a better scenario for that? I, I really, I would not make avoiding probate my primary goal in life because uh, all probate is is the court system that executes the will. And so if you leave a will, the will is probated, meaning that the probate court enforces the will. That's all it means. Now, some tax, some states have higher taxes on the size of the estate. And if you can avoid probate with a trust or with some other mechanisms, you're moving it outside of that probate tax. But in an effort to save a 3% tax on probate, you, pay a whole lot more. you oftentimes can step over into a neck deep into the boiling grease. Mm. You know, I mean, it's bad. So you get just completely fried here. This is The Ramsey Show. Financial Peace University will teach you not only how to get out of debt, not only how to live on a budget, not only how on how to agree with your spouse about money, not only how to make it as a single person with money, not only how to invest and become wealthy, but how to be outrageously generous. We've got all of that in there. It's a big deal. You're going to learn how to handle your money straight up from our experts. We've got a community of thousands of people taking the class with you and encouraging you. And uh, guess what? The personalities, the Ramsey personalities are doing Financial Peace University classes. George, have a bunch of people signed up for yours? Oh, yeah. Mine starts June 20th. So I'm later on in the summer. Uh, Jade's and Rachel starts tonight. So that one's already booked up and ready to go. And we got Ken Coleman, Dr. John Deloney. So join any of them. Eddie Cullen. Eddie Cullen, our host, is going to be leading one as well. So pick your poison. And a lot of people are doing it based off of times and dates. So mine's June 20th, uh, 1230 Eastern Time, 1130 Central Time on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We have Jade, some of the evenings. Jade's is at night. Rachel's at, is at lunch, I think. Yes. Yeah. So anyway, you can go to the page, uh, fpu.com. Just go fpu.com, just like that. and Or just go to ramseysolutions.com and click on FPU. You'll find it. But the, the personalities are doing classes and... Uh, you can get signed up, and they will be your coordinators. Now, the classes are still taught by the same videos that have George and Rachel, Dr. The content John Deloney, doesn't change. me. The content's the same, but the coordinator of the class, you're going to have a Ramsey personality as your coordinator. Tony is in Austin, Texas. Hi, Tony. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, David George. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So wanted to get your opinion. I have a little bit of a unique situation compared to most of your callers. I'm 27 years old. I've been really fortunate with the job I have now. I've been able to build up a pretty big nest egg, about 420000 in cash. Good for you. And thank you. And I was really want to get both of your opinions on how I plan to diversify it. Awesome. How'd you so, do it, by the way? I work in medical cells. One thing I've always done really well is been able to save money, but... I also have analysis paralysis, and I've been standing in my own way when it comes to investing and multiplying that money. Okay. So it's just sitting in a, in a savings account right now? It is. About 100 of it is in a high-yield savings account, and then the other 320 is just in a conventional bank, which, of course, losing me money. And are you wanting to go one particular way? Because we generally oh, yeah. recommend so, mutual funds and real estate as a general mm-hmm. investment recommendation. So, and that's part of what I was wanting to gather feedback on. What I plan to do is I want to keep 50 in a high yield savings. I'm wanting to put 200 into mutual funds and then the remaining 170 looking to both pay off my remaining student loan balance and then also put towards a real estate down payment. So you don't currently have a home, you're renting and how much consumer debt do you have? 
I only have about 25 in student loans. So the student loans can get paid three weeks ago. Right. Like before nightfall, dude. Today. Pay off your student loans. You hear me? Mm-hmm. You going to do sure. that? Yep. And truthfully, I would rather just pay cash for a home versus get fancy with investing right now. Yep. Yep. What price range home are you thinking about buying? So, of course, I don't want to open leverage. I ideally want to stay under 400 k okay. okay. You've got the money. Yeah, just pay cash for a home. That's your next step. And then save towards, uh, start saving towards investing at that point. And uh, no, I would not put 50 k Do you have any an emergency fund in addition to this, or is this your total cash position? Total cash, and that's, of course, not including the 401k that I keep separate. Right, right. Okay. So what is your income? Uh, last year was just under 450 k Good for you. Fantastic. Man, you are slaying it. Okay, here's what I would do if I woke up in your shoes at 27 years old. You've done very well. You're a natural saver, and you have a fabulously large income. So, as you said, you've been very blessed. Uh, but you've also made a lot of good choices, and you're a hardworking guy, and you didn't exactly quiet quit your way into 450K. You've been kicking butt and taking names. Way to go. I like you a lot. Okay? So, if I woke up in your shoes, I would follow the baby steps because I am positive after doing this for 30 years that they are the shortest possible route between where you are and substantial wealth. The shortest, fastest, safest route. So, first thing is debt-free. So write a check today. Now we got 395000 left after being, paying off the student loan. Did I do my math correctly? You did, yep. The next step is baby step three. Three to six months of household expenses as an emergency fund. We can call that what we want to call it. You decide what that number is. For our purposes, let's see, three ninety-five. Let's call it forty-five. That leaves us three hundred and fifty thousand. If we put forty-five into an emergency fund, that is not to be touched for anything but emergencies. By the way, that's a separate savings account, not to be touched for any reason unless a dire emergency happens. And when you're making four hundred fifty k, there's not many dire emergencies you can't cash flow. Okay, so this is really, 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 really the backstop. So then we move on to baby step four. You start saving 15% of your income into 401ks and Roth IRAs. That's going to be a bit of a challenge, but you'll have to get to doing it, making your 450. Beyond that, I'm going to pay cash for my home. I think I got, if I did my math right, 350,000 left to pay cash for a home. And I would buy a home for cash for that much or less. Now, here's where we're sitting at this point. We have a fully funded emergency fund. We have zero debt, including a paid for house. And you're freaking 27 years old. Now, from there on, four fifty. Now you're in a, in a heartbeat. You're gonna have another three hundred grand laying around, right? Yes, sir. Like a year. I mean, really. Mm-hmm. How much can you spend? Seriously. So, and you're not a spender anyway. So, you, when the, the next time you come to me with this question, with a paid for house and no student loans and a fully funded emergency fund, George would tell you, okay, mutual funds are fine, or paid for real estate is fine. Taking out a mortgage for real estate investing, I would not do. But I would buy some cash real estate with this future cash after we've executed this plan or uh, and or I would do mutual funds. Tony, I personally have done both. And I'm the 62-year-old version of you. And I now own millions of dollars of both, real estate and mutual funds, tens of millions of dollars of both, real estate and mutual funds. And so that's where you're headed. You're going to, if you continue somewhat on this track you're going to have a net worth in excess of a hundred million dollars i believe it and you don't have to do real estate says he's 27 yeah and if you follow social media they'll tell you you got to get into real estate if you're not comfortable with real estate right now go slow you can just do mutual funds there's no rule that says but i want you to have a paid for primary residence regardless don't buy real estate if you don't um enjoy people and drama dave enjoys both clearly i do I mean, I, I, conflict is like fun for hillbillies, so I like it, you know. But it's just drama, and there's going to be some drama. So if you don't want any drama in your life, don't buy real estate. Because it, it's even even commercial real estate. You know, you get the small business, you, you know, they, they can't go to work because Fauci said there's a quarantine or something. You know, I mean, stuff like that happens, right? So you got all kinds of problems. It's going to be there. And with mutual funds, you just open the email, and it tells you how much is in there. No drama. 
Doesn't make you as much money, but no drama. Yeah, so well, you, you can do either upside. or both is what we suggest. And both will appreciate over the long term. Exactly. History has shown us that. Exactly. So yeah. You can become a multimillionaire either way. Good mutual funds should be a 10 to a 12% rate of return. The stock market has averaged 112 since its inception. Real estate all in with uh, value increases, cash flow, tax write-offs, everything included. It's called an internal rate of return there. should be north of 17%. If you got a decent piece of real estate. That's if you do it right. And But it's got a hassle factor that the mutual funds doesn't have. It's got the drama and the people factor. And so some of both or both is fine. Anything in there is all right. So that, that's the plan. Good question, man. Good question. Congratulations. What a stud. That's impressive. Those, yeah. are, the kind, those are the right questions to be asking. Man. 27 making 450. I mean, what's he going to He's going to be a millionaire at 28 or 29. Yeah. 20 or 29. Ought to be making that much. If he follows our suggestion, if he screws around and goes in debt on that house to buy a house and then messes around with all this other stuff, keeps the student loan around like it's a pet, you know, you're going to have a problem. But, dude, Get rid of just it, Tony. follow this system, man. It's really That's works. chump change in your world. It really works. Why are you sitting on this student loan? What is it, a pet? Sally Mae's an ugly woman. Get her out of your house. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey, George Camel here. If you love the show and you want a deeper dive on your money journey, we've got a weekly newsletter that gives you helpful articles and tips on following the Ramsey way. Just go to RamseySolutions.com today to sign up for the newsletter. Again, that's RamseySolutions.com to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the pods, moving, and storage studios. It's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. Thank you for joining us, America. We're so glad you're here. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. He's the host of the George Camel YouTube site, and oh, if you haven't seen this, he is the master of snark. We have a good time. I'm a huge fan. I've actually tried to uh, solicit some of the printers to come up with a snark font, and they haven't done it yet. Sarcasm font. It would be nice to have one. Just type with that. Because some people just don't understand. But anyway, yeah, you got the king of snark over here to my right, and he's got a great new YouTube channel taking on all the toxicity that's out there and the stupidity that's out there in the world. You don't want to miss this. It's highly popular. Several hundreds of thousands of people are already joining us there. Thank you for doing that. The George Kimmel YouTube channel. 888-825-5225 is our number here. Christina's in Yuma, Arizona. Hi, Christina. How are you? Great. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Well, thank you for taking my question. Um, I recently sat down with an educational company that uh, teaches you how to use a HELOC as your primary mortgage. So I know that secondary HELOCs are a terrible idea, but they had this idea of using a HELOC as your primary and only loan at the house so that like all of your um, deposits and uh, from your job and everything are put directly in the HELOC, you still have access to it. And so the premise is you since you're putting everything in it and you still have access to it, you can God, is that pay that, off that scam is still around. I thought that thing That's had died. Good. This is not an educational company. This is a scam. Okay. They're not educational uh, at all. No. So their their premise is is that you use the HELOC and you pay all your bills out of the HELOC HELOC and then you use your uh, your income, and it's direct deposited to pay down the HELOC each month. So you're using your HELOC much like a checking account, as if that's some advantage. Because, by the way, when all the money comes in and all the money goes out, the same amount's left in there, whether mm -hmm. it's a checking account or a HELOC. There's no magic to a HELOC. Okay. You follow me? So, so I follow what you is your income? What's your income? Um, let's see, combined is around 130 Okay. Thousand. Okay, so let's call. Let's just make it up. Ten thousand dollars a month. Okay, right. Okay. So you put ten thousand dollars a month on your HELOC, direct deposited 
reduce your HELOC by $10,000 from your income this month, right? Then Mm -hmm. you use your HELOC and you pay all your bills to the tune of $10,000 and the HELOC balance goes back up. You follow me? Mm Mm-hmm. There's absolutely no change. This is just a checking account. And these guys act like it's mystical, magical, and does something different. It doesn't do a dadgum thing. It makes them rich, so it does that. You're paying them a fee for their education, but yeah. You follow me? There's no advantage at all. Zero. If you want to pay down your mortgage, all mortgages are calculated on simple interest. So when you pay down your mortgage, it always reduces the amount of interest you are paying the next month. A hundred percent of them. Okay. HELOC or otherwise. HELOC simple interest also. So it does not get you out of debt any faster than a traditional mortgage by the fact that you're running your bills in and out of a HELOC and your income in and out of a HELOC. It's just circular. You, you The P is still under the shell. Does this make sense? Okay. You follow me? Mm-hmm. I follow yeah. you. What was the purpose in getting the HELOC? What made that, you go, I'm interested in this? No, they, she because got, they she sold got you on suckered this? into this education company. It had nothing to do with the HELOC. She wasn't looking for a HELOC. They were looking for her. Mm. Right? Uh, yes. Um, I was looking at, uh, I'd seen the ads about um, how you can pay your house off really fast, mm-hmm. and I just was curious. And I haven't done it yet. I yeah. just let me, let me just, I got, let me, let me, let's, try, let's try again, okay? Just to make really sure you understand, because I'm not 100% I got through. So the way the house is paid off is when you pay down the principal. Mm -hmm. Running your bills in and out of the house, your income into the house, your bills back out of the house, does not pay down the principal. If out of your $10,000 you wanted to reduce principal $3,000, you could just take $3,000 out of your checking account. Put it on principal. If you put nothing on principal, principal's not going down. You put 3000 on principal, that's the only way the house is paid off. It does not get paid off because you ran your bills in and out of it. That does nothing to pay off your house. The only thing that pays off your house is you pay on the principal. That's the only way. That's the only way their system works. But they've got this little... Uh, chart crap that they show you that you're going to use so so much of your income to actually reduce principal well duh of course you could do that anyway and you don't need them so now run from this please please run from this how much mortgage are you talking about taking out uh well we just recently bought our house so um we owe around 290 oh okay just leave that alone then just just leave these people alone have i convinced you please (laughs) yeah (laughs) okay right Sure. Run from Crisis the education. Crisis averted. Right. Education yeah. company. That's yeah. my favorite part of their marketing scheme. Yeah. I, I, I met with this education company. Yeah. yeah they were educating you. So, um, yeah. Hey, okay. So that, I thought that thing, man, I haven't seen that scam in probably a decade. A lot of this crap's coming back around, though. Tic-tac, it's like fashion trends. TikTok is bringing a lot of it back. That's true. Well, the yeah, whole life like, people There's a whole out. other generation that hasn't been screwed yet. So we got to bring back all the old scams and you know, get to the, get to the young people. Well, That's back in your day do. that you had to seek out stupid. Now it just shows up in your face 60 seconds at a time from some slick well, guy. I, yeah. Your algorithm will help you get there for sure. Um, you're, yeah, but yeah. And the other one was the, um, what's the thing called the whole life savings program, a 707 or a 770, whatever. Oh, you remember that one? No. It's the same kind of crap, but it's day? a whole life agent. Okay. A whole, whole life product. I know infinite banking. That's the one. That's the one. Okay. That's the one. But it's got a, it's got a number to it that they use. But it's, oh. a, you know, it's also just a complete. Where the, I mean, it's, it's not a life by hack. scam. I don't mean criminally illegal. I just mean it's so stupid it should be criminal. That's what I mean by scam. It's just the whole like, like you can Dave, debt is tax free. You can borrow from yourself. Exactly. That whole idea. Yeah. Yeah. Because a hundred percent of the time you borrow money. Borrowed money is not taxable, people. It's not income. And if you borrow your own money, yeah, it's not taxable either, and you're stupid because you just paid interest to borrow your own money. You're pulling a fast one on you. That's you. You got him, buddy. You oh you goodness. got the guy. Oh wait a minute, the guy's me. Oh crap. <laughs> if you just think about this stuff long enough, you should back yourself off the ledge. The problem is, it's all impulsive, it's, and a guy told you from well, an education. Well, and they man and a TikTok. Let me just tell you there, too. The other thing, the thing about the infinite banking and these guys here too is you will get screwed more often by an enthusiastic ignoramus 
than you will by an actual con artist. Because some of these morons actually believe this stuff. And they, because they believe it, they can make you believe it. But it's, uh, yeah, enthusiastic ignoramuses. There's a lot more of those than actual con artists. They're the same ones selling you a star in the galaxy, Dave, with your name on it. Those are the same guys. They've just switched That's, businesses. Is that back, too? <laughs> That's back, They're baby. Back. It's called an NFT now, Dave. Look into it. <laughs> you own it, I promise. <laughs> Unbelievable. It's virtual ownership. I mean, just think about that. This is The Ramsey Show. Hey guys, being free to make your own medical decisions is a big deal these days. Christian Healthcare Ministries gives members the freedom to choose the doctors and providers they want without the frustration of worrying about networks and with no waiting period to join. It's a membership-based nonprofit ministry where hundreds of thousands of Christians share funds to pay for and pray for each other's medical bills. For over 40 years, CHM has helped families living across all 50 states. So see if CHM could be right for your family. Check out more today at chministries.org slash budget. George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today. The question of the day is brought to you by Neighborly, your hub for home services after fires or floods. Their rainbow restoration pros offer homeowners trusted full service restoration expertise like mold remediation, carpet cleaning, odor removal, and more. Visit Neighborly.com today and you can find rainbow restoration services in your area. Today's question comes from Bethany in Indiana. I'm in baby step two and looking forward to when I can budget more for my fun money. I'm trying to stay motivated and making a list of things I can do when I finally pay off all my debt. What are some of the things you spend fun money on? Now that's a fun question. A lot of fun in this question. So the things that we say not to do when you're in debt, that would be first on my list. Things like eating out, going on vacation, uh, upgrading a car for fun instead of uh, because you have to. So that would be at the top, is those just things that make life a little bit sweeter, like eating out. So after you're out of debt, you could put back on a restaurant budget, put back in a budget for vacations, put back in an upgrade for, um, Whitney would, and Sharon would say furnishings. Oh, that's a nice word we for We would it. have to upgrade the old furnishings because that old couch sucks. The home decor. Yeah. That was sticking me in the back with that broken spring. Yeah. Yep. And then there's things, you know, your hobbies. Things that you just enjoy doing that cost money. Maybe for Dave, it would be golf these days. So during Baby Step 2, we are not devoid of fun. We're devoid of paying for fun. Yes. Ding, 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 ding. There's a big difference. See, fun is like happiness. Like hiking is a hobby that can cost you nothing. So that's a great one. There you go. Frisbee in the park. But a lot of people's hobbies are wildly expensive and they uh, justify it. So again... Fun money is not just for post-baby step two, but we limit it while we're in baby step two so that we can allocate more towards getting out of debt. You know, and what's weird is we often hear stories of people, it it makes you reassess that you can't purchase fun. Fun is a decision or happiness. You can't purchase it. Mm. It's a decision, you know, and so, you know, joy These are things, so, I mean, for real, going for a walk, for real, going for a hike, for real, doing things, the kind of old school things, if you will, and uh, think about, you know, what, what, what is entertaining, and it resets your mind, because we are so programmed in our culture today, especially with smartphone, right, we're so programmed to think a certain way that this is where, you know, there should be an app, that you just went fun and it just sent you a box, you know, a box of, here's a box of fun. I'm sure there's one for that. I'm sure there is. But you know, the, the point being that, that probably doesn't have anything to do with your smartphone. Matter of fact, I'm pretty sure it doesn't. Yeah. I mean, good relationships and good hobbies go a long way more than, you know, just going out 
to the bars every weekend or whatever it is. And look at what caused you to go into debt and look at the root of it. The things that were actually pure that weren't to impress others or things that had the right motivations and go, you know, I really do enjoy XYZ. I'm going to allocate more money towards that and put a line item in there. And then there's no regret, no remorse. Once you're but I mean, debt. like the number of times you talk to, say, an old person that went through the Great Depression, not as many left around these days, but if you had the pleasure of having conversations with them, they both they talked about the Great Depression uh, as both a time of great sacrifice, a great need, but they also found a part of themselves during that time that they wouldn't have found otherwise. And while you're working to get out of debt, you can kind of discover, you know, relationships, sunshine, these important things that are out there that do qualify for baby step two stuff. It's the stuff Sharon and I did. We did nothing. All we did, all I did was work. And then if we were going to do something, it was super, 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 like no money involved. Wow. You know, and, and we got out of debt and we got everything cleaned up and got the IRS out of our life. God help me. All right. Mitchell is in Chattanooga. Hey, Mitchell, welcome to the Ramsey show. Hey guys. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. What's up? So a uh, budget question this year in January, I recently started a new job that is sales. So it's base plus commission. So I have the same base pay every month, but so far in the last three months, the commission has been sporadic. So I'm trying to figure out how I would work that. I use the every dollar budget mm -hmm. and I'm trying to figure out how I manage that and work that with each month being I have the same amount in commit and base but the commission's different I'm just trying to figure out how to manage that commission so what would be your worst month my worst month just base, would be I guess. just base pay 2500 a month okay and what are your basic expenses when you look at your four walls your food utilities housing transportation what does it cost to cover those maybe 2000 a month Okay. Including the so mortgage. So on your worst month, you've got all the necessities taken care of. Correct. And so beyond that, start to make the next list of priorities until on the other end of the spectrum is just the fun luxuries of life. But if you went, hey, okay. we don't have money for that this month, we're not going to allocate that in the budget. Okay. And it's a prioritized spending plan for everything. So your three months that were sporadic, what were the three numbers above your base? What were the three commission amounts? Uh, February was my first month of actual selling. So it was about 2000 last month was 5,000. And then this month I'm pulling in uh, 9,000. Nice trend. It's been going up. Yes. So you're yeah. like at 11, five, you're at 11, five with your base, right? Correct. You're not earning through the base. It's base plus. Correct. Yes. Okay. So 11, five for the month. Okay. You think that trend line continues? I hope it does. But what what are the uh, what's the state. guys that do what you do? What's the most they make? Uh, the average among everybody is between seven and eight thousand dollars a month. Correct. Yes. Of commission. Okay, so you're already above average after the third month. Correct. Okay, is that sustainable, or did you just get lucky? Well, it might have been luck this month. I had one big sale come through because if okay. that sale didn't go through, I'd be at three and a half. Gotcha. Okay. So what I would do is I, I would budget your low average of these. So I, I'm thinking your low average is four or five K of commission. I don't think you're going to dip right. below that again. Do you? No. Okay. So let's take, let's take five K that's $7,500 now. And let's run a regular budget on 7,500 because you're very unlikely to go below that. And then, right. okay. I mean, if you do, you step back in, correct your every dollar as you're doing it. And then everything above that, do what George said and say, okay, if I make a dime more than 7,500, what is the number one goal I've got for money beyond right. my, beyond what I covered with the 7,500, right? And you, that's your mm -hmm. number one. Okay. If I got that done, what's the next thing I would do? Number two, the next thing I would do, number three. So if you're working your debt snowball or something, your number one goal is going to be that next, next debt on the list, right? right. If, if you're saving money for uh, build up your emergency fund of three to six months of expenses of baby step three, then your number one goal would be that throw money into right. baby, into the emergency fund until it's done. Then once you're doing that, then my number one goal is 15% of my income. Oh, now we're going to take 15% out once we get to baby step four. Oh, and then we're going to start kids college. Oh, and then the number one goal after that, 
I might be saving up for a better car, or I might be saving up for a vacation, or by the way, Christmas this year's in December. We ought to get ready, and they don't move it, and you know that kind of stuff. So you you start laying these things out, but you're what you're doing is you're prioritizing every dollar for the coming month beyond the seventy five hundred stated every dollar budget, and you just have a to do list in order of how I want to spend it. So you always spend more money on paper than you're going to have coming in. I love it. And I'm going to do you one better. Hang on the line. Austin's going to pick up. I want to gift you one year of every dollar premium. And there's a great tool called Paycheck Planning in there that will also help you with this along the way, where it'll tell you exactly when and if you would run out of money and you can reallocate your spending, your bills for that purpose. But I love people call in, Dave, and they go, I can't do a budget, Dave, because I have a regular income. So this is not for me. You, you need a budget more than anyone. Absolutely, because you'll you'll fall into the thing of trying to out earn your stupidity. I did that straight commission for years, mm. and uh, I almost did it. Almost but the, succeeded. But the, but the stupid was big. It was bigger than the income. So there you go. That's how it goes. This is the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dr. John Deloney here. I'm a huge fan of both meditation and prayer. And good mental health includes slowing down, gaining control of your thoughts, and plugging into something bigger than you. And Hallow makes it easy to start a daily practice of meditation, prayer, and finding peace. Hallow is the number one Bible app in the world, and you can tailor content towards your faith tradition. From scripture readings and prayers to meditation, In journaling, Hallow makes it easy to practice prayer, meditate, and build a deeper, more meaningful spiritual life and rediscover true peace. Go to hallow.com slash Ramsey today to get three months of Hallow for free. That's hallow.com slash Ramsey. George Camel, Ramsey personality, joins me here on the Ramsey Show as my co-host. Uh, you want to give away some money? I, well, I would love that. Uh, never using my money to give away stuff is my favorite thing. To, I think it's my spiritual gift at this point to give away your money, Dave. And uh, well, Everybody's got to have a calling. And it can't happen for me because I work here. I think that's only fair. But for you all listening out there, we've got a chance for you to win some of Dave's money in the Ramsey Cash Giveaway. All month long, you can enter to win up to 500 bucks or the $3,000 grand prize. All you got to do is go to RamseySolutions.com slash giveaway. And yes, real people actually win this stuff, which is really cool. Make sure to enter every single day to increase your chance to win. There's no purchase necessary, but sorry, kids. You do have to be 18 or older to win. And today just keeps getting better because the $10 sale is back. And you all know I love a good deal. And this is about uh, as good of a deal as you're going to get on all of the products that you need to start building wealth, a career you love, improve almost, your mental almost health. Almost all of our best-selling books are $10. That's impressive. That's like... Well, and we got some new ones on there this year. Yeah, like... Jo- Dr. John Deloney's is on there, Own yeah. Your Past, Change Your Future. Mm-hmm. Uh, Baby Steps Millionaires is on there. Mm-hmm. That's Dave's latest book that lays out stories of real people, including teachers who became millionaires using the Baby Steps. And I did some math, Dave, because I was curious what $3,000 can get you in today's world. So the grand prize is $3,000, no purchase necessary, and what can $3,000 get you? Well, it can get you 85 days of doggy daycare, if you're me, which is pretty impressive. You're kidding. Yeah. Is that a lot to you or a little? I don't know. What is doggy daycare? It's where you send your dog to be taken care of while you're at work. Oh, it no. can't just wait on you to get home? Well, you want to give it a good life, Dave. You know, you send your kids to daycare, why not the dog? Oh, Lord, what is this world coming to? You tell me. Okay. Uh, It can get you less than a tenth of a Bitcoin, if you're interested in that. 
Neither one of these sound like a good idea. Okay, we're 0 for 2 for Dave. Okay, yeah. It could get you, get this, 300 copies of the Total Money Makeover. Now I'm in. Okay. Imagine that. All right. If you win this giveaway and you turn around and buy 300 copies of the Total Money Makeover. Change 300 people's lives with a coaster for their coffee table. Here's what else could get you. Maybe, and I mean maybe, two Taylor Swift tickets. Yeah, one and a half. Depending on the day. I don't know who the half going is, but you get one and a half for that. Goodness gracious. And lastly, this is my favorite. It can actually buy you a beater car in 2023. And James, our producer, did the research because I know the haters are coming after us already. Here's what this can get you in the Nashville area. A 2002 Honda with 117,000 miles on it for three grand. That's a Jesus car. Is it? Yeah, he said they're all in one accord. (laughs) There you go. He'll be here all week. 3,000 bucks. Bada boom. Right? You okay. missed your calling in stand-up, Dave. I did. But instead, he's giving away I'm money. I'm sitting down. There you go. I okay. love it. Don't miss it. RamseySolutions.com slash giveaway. I told you so. 3000 bucks. It's impressive. And all you got to do is just come register. That's it. Come hang out with us. RamseySolutions.com. LaRonda is with us in Roanoke, Virginia. Hi, LaRonda. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Thank you very much. How can we help? Yes, uh, I'm currently working two jobs to try to make ends meet. However, I'm 59 years old, and my credit report shows that I owe $258,000 in student loans. Is there any way I can make that go away? Good Lord. You're 58? I'm 59. 59. And the what did you study and when? Well, actually, I have three degrees, and... With parents and and students going to college, they make the parents do the Parent PLUS loans and pay for them. Make? Hold on. You said they make them? Uh, My son wasn't able to get the tuition for his classes, and I had to do Parent PLUS loans the whole four years for him. Or not go to that school. Okay. So you did. (laughs) Yeah. So what is your uh, household income? Uh, I, the, my regular job is like 60000 a year. I have a mortgage. And you got three degrees in what? Uh, the first degree was in multidisciplinary studies, criminal justice and religion. The second was a master's in accounting and then a master of divinity in theology and homiletics. So why does a master's in accounting only make sixty grand? Uh, there's a long story about that. I, I don't think that a master's in accounting in this area would get you 60 grand. It just so happens the job that I work at now pays a little bit more. And you're in accounting full-time? No, I'm in logistics. I'm a logistics specialist at Volvo Trucks. I'm extra confused. So we got the divinity stuff. You're not doing anything with that. We got accounting. You're not doing anything with that. We've moved to logistics. Well, you're using accounting yeah. and logistics. but yeah. Uh, okay. And the multidisciplinary criminal justice is not in use. Um Okay, so, well, the answer to your question, because these are disturbing numbers at 59 years old, the answer to your question is uh, we have to make more money. And you have not monetized your knowledge base very well. Um, Most people with a master's in accounting make 100, 100 and a quarter a year starting just to get going. You should be able to pass your CPA uh, with a master's in accounting, and you should move into that field and get up into the six figures. That's going to be mandatory. I'm a little lost as to why your career is so uh, underproducing with all of your knowledge base. But whatever the reason for that, you need to do a little soul searching, and we need to move your income way up, like dramatically. As a matter of fact, I'd like you to be at 120 heading towards 220. And, oh, and, that would be wonderful. And by the way, supply chain generally pays more than 60K. Mm-hmm. And Roanoke, right. is Roanoke, Virginia is not a backward town. I mean... That's a substantial city. Um, I think I don't think it's anything to do with the, the uh, areas of study or the area you live in as much as it does your attitude towards it. Well, when I when I tried to apply in the accounting field, our handicap is that through the college that I went to, uh, Liberty University, they they teach you how to do everything the hard way. But when you go in for a job interview, they want you to know how to do it through the computer where previously we had to do it with two calculators and work it out the hard way. They want you to already have experience in SAP, which is just a, um, plugging in the figures and letting the software do what it's supposed to do. Yeah, but that's not rocket science. I, I mean, know, and they think it for is. For God's sakes, I can do it. 
So, right. And I can't even operate my phone hardly. So, yeah, <laughs> I mean, um, yeah, SAP is a standard. You, you know, you don't do accounting by calculators and haven't in decades. So, um, and the other piece of this is the student loans, are, there's no way to just make them go away. I mean, you can't even bankrupt these things. And if you want to see stories of that, go watch Borrowed Future. And so there's going to be a conversation with the kids. I don't know if they're willing to chip in for their loans, even though it's legally on you. I would still see and say, hey, mama wants to retire one day. And uh, if they make good money in their careers, can they pay some of this down? Yeah. Um, you, you're going to, if you do not uh, get above this instead of laying under it in terms of this being your career, where the career problems are all happening to you, and instead you start happening to the career issues and get on top of this and, and get up, leave the cave, kill something, and drag it home, the math on this is really, really not going to go well. 60 to pay off, 258 at 59, that's the, called a small shovel and a very large hole. We have to change your shovel to hole ratio mathematically to get you out because they don't. these are not going away. They're not going away. So the way you get rid of them is you increase your income dramatically and you keep your lifestyle down at nothing, which it probably already is. And uh, then you just start throwing the difference at this very, very, very aggressively. So let's just pretend that over a year or two of working on this that you got to, let's just be real generous, 160. Well, that's 100 above what you're making now. And then you start throwing 100 at 258. You're done in three or four years because by then it will have grown some. So it's not going to be a straight line issue. So that's what you're dealing with. Supply chain is not a bad field. Accounting is not a bad field. Both are hiring now and both are computer driven. Uh, and you're, you're going to learn to operate a computer if you don't know how, if you're going to win at this. So figure out what you've got to do to get to where you're happening to your career with this knowledge base, because you've paid a lot of money for all this knowledge and you're not getting anything for it and you need to you need to monetize the knowledge base that's what it amounts to so hang on we'll send you a copy of ken coleman's book from paycheck to purpose i'm also going to sign you up free for his assessment his career assessment i want you to take that and let's get above this thing George Camel Ramsey personality is my co-host today. You can see his new YouTube channel anytime you want. Just check out the George Camel YouTube show. It's pretty stinking incredible. Hey, if you're liking this show and a bunch of you are new, thank you for that. Just let y'all know the inside story. We don't have a $300 million a year marketing budget. We don't have a football stadium named after us like... Oh, I don't know. Suffer or something like that. Excuse me. Allergies are bad. Bless you. But the, uh, the, uh, uh, but anyway, so the only way this show grows and, and we help people, more people is you tell people about it. So we appreciate that. Share it. Tell people you listen, tell people where your talk radio show is or talk radio station you listen to, or you can share it digitally. If you're a podcaster or a podcast listener or a YouTube follower or something like that, you can just hit the share button, hit the subscribe button, the follow button. And that way it'll automatically show up on your devices and we'll be there for you all the time. And uh, also, by the way, leave a five-star review where you can. Uh, one stars are not helpful. Mama said if you hadn't got anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. But all the five stars we can get and all the shares and the follows and the subscribes, all of those things push the show to the front of all the Internet algorithms and cause it to show up on new people's. Uh, searches faster and easier, and we get more and more people we can help. Thank you for that. We appreciate you. Daniel's in Atlanta. Hi, Daniel. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, thanks, Dave. Thanks for having me on. Sure. What's up? Um, so basically, um, I have the ability to totally pay off my home right now, but 
I am getting married in July, and my uh, my fiance she's in medical school, and by the time her student loans are due, she's going to have around three hundred thousand in student loans to pay off, and. I was just trying to get some advice on how I could potentially um, or what I should do with, with my house right now because I have that three-year buffer until any payments are due um, to help my fiancé. So she's got three years of school left? Yeah. So and how's she paying for that? School. I'll just so – I'll, I'll be helping her. She's, she's just taking straight loans um, – now, I'm saying after you're married, uh-huh. what, what is your income? Okay. Um, so right now, I, I have a fairly volatile income, but my salary is is 110 and, uh, last and How much year, do you have in income. savings? Um, I have 275000 in savings right now. Okay. What's it take for her to finish school after July? Uh, how much? Yes. The, the the grand total for her to to finish up is going to be three hundred thousand. The total of our whole schooling, but she's already started, hasn't she? Yes. Okay. Yes. How the much does it take her- from this point forward to finish? Um. So she's already so so it'll be that's going to be the entire total. So I'm not. I'm not exactly sure what she's taken out so far. Well, that'd be good information to get since you're marrying her. Yeah. What's left on your mortgage? So I have, um, well, I know that that it's going to be 300000 whenever, whenever it's all said and done. But it's not so. all said and done yet. Okay, so she's already been in school, what, a year? She's been in, she's been in school. Um, She's finishing her second year. Okay, and she's got three more to go. Yeah, she's. Okay. Yeah, if we she's call three hundred into to five, that'd be sixty thousand a year. If we're guessing, right? No, so it's 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 gonna be three hundred total. I got whenever, that. Whenever she, whenever she's okay. But my point is, here's what I'm trying to lead towards, and you don't have the numbers and you're trying to box me into some kind of corner, or you just truly don't know. So the deal is this. What I want you guys to do is I want you to pay cash from this point forward with your money after from July forward, after you're married. I I don't want her to take out any more loans. I want to use your 275 for her to finish school. No more loans. And my guess is she probably has between 50 and 100 right now. That's my guess. Okay. And so she probably needs another 200 or so to get through school, but let's budget and take set aside of your cash, what it takes for her to finish med school. That's most important because the first okay. step to getting out of debt is not going further in. Right. Okay. okay. Do no more harm. Similar sure. to her okay. Hippocratic oath she'll take later. Right. Do no more harm. Right. Okay, so we're going to just, we're going to cash flow. Now, whatever cash you have above what it takes for her to finish from today forward, then we're going to start talking about paying off her student loans. Then once those are gone, we're going to work towards paying off your house. That's working the baby steps. First, borrow no more. Second, begin to address the existing debts that are there. Third, we have an emergency fund. Fourth, we build and, and we start to pay off the house in baby step six. That's what you've got to, but you, what okay. you've got to ascertain to do that is you've got to find out what it takes in cash from July forward for her to finish school. And that is a number less than 300 because 300 is all in. Correct? Right. Okay. okay. We got there. So yeah, the goal is not to take any new loans when July hits and you guys are married. So Cash flow the wedding, cash flow the honeymoon. Let's come back. Let's look at the pile of money we have, our incomes, our debt load, and begin to pay it all off. Yeah. And then when she graduates and is an MD, hopefully her income will be north of 200 pretty quick. 
and your income. And so you're going to have a three, four hundred thousand dollar household income, and you'll finish paying off the house very quickly at that point um, with what's going on. So you've done a great job saving money. Uh, you're signing up for a debt ride. That's part of what goes with July. You've got a big old debt ride, but we're not going to just keep piling on the debt while we reduce the debt over on the other side on the house. That doesn't make sense at all. In a sense, that's like borrowing student loans to pay off your house. Mathematically, it's about the same thing. It's just a balance suite, balance pay off three hundred, take switch. out three hundred. Yeah, it's you know exactly. We're going to pay off three hundred on the house, but we're going to take out three hundred over here on student loans. So that's the same as borrowing on student loans to pay off your house, which we wouldn't tell you to do that, and nobody would do that on purpose either. It's just a, but that's the net result of all this trying to hide the pee under a shell thing. When people talk about Dave, we took a call earlier and someone said, is it fair? Because it's not, it's not her fault. I went into this debt and we just walked him through this and went, Hey, you, you saved up hundreds of thousands of dollars. And all of a sudden you get married and you go, Oh, but I worked so hard for that. I got to pay off her medical debt. How do you overcome that? You are marrying a doctor. So there's That's a, helpful. there's an there's upside that. there. There's if you want to play uh, tit for tat, quid pro quo here. You should be able to get a great income out of this, yeah, as, as you go along. Assuming but there's an there. attitude and mindset that goes along with getting married that's hard for people to stomach in this very independence-driven world. Where we go, I worked hard for this, Dave. I shouldn't have to pay off their loans. There is that mentality. Yeah, but he wasn't saying that. He was just trying to figure out the best strategy. I was impressed by him because he was so quick to go, all right, I'm going to pay off her debt. I'm going to yeah. cash flow her med school, which exactly. is or do I very pay off, Or do I pay off my house, which is wise. That's what he was asking. So yeah. it, wasn't a, it wasn't a tight hold on it. But that's, a, th that, that's how we'd handle it, Daniel. Um, the other thing that I, I, I want everybody to be careful of, and we, we've seen it in the last hour, um, be careful of your language. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth speaks. So I was forced to. I'm trapped. I had I'm, to. I'm, I can't do this. In our area, you can't do this. And all of these absolutism-type statements and verbiages indicate a victim mentality, indicate you're stuck. And you're not stuck. Um, and, and when Daniel kept saying, all in, all in, all in, it's like it presupposes that debt is the only way to do this. And it's not presupposed, because you called the place where we don't do it. We presuppose quite the opposite. And uh, so don't presuppose. All in, we're not doing all in. We're not going that, that's not the plan we're on anymore. It just changed. She's marrying you, and you got money. There you go. This is The Ramsey Show. Dave here. You can find all of our shows with the Ramsey Network app on your smartphone. It's the only place to listen to the entire back catalog of episodes. Download the Ramsey Network app in your favorite app store today. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Pods Moving and Storage Studios, it's the Ramsey Show, where we help people build wealth, do work that they love, and create actual amazing relationships. George Camel, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. We're so glad you're with us. Thank you for joining us. 888 825 -5225. Justin is starting off this hour in Salt Lake City. Hi, Justin. What's up? Hi, how's it going, Dave? Great, man. How can we help? So I'm trying to be able to afford a house, and I've got a business running that's going about six figures this year, but I seem to be able to barely afford paying taxes, and I'm using credit to do that. So you're just start now starting to make six figures? Yeah, this year will be the first year I will cross over that. Are you working with a tax pro, or are you just ignoring the, the tax bills when they come? What What's happened here that you've used credit to pay for it? Well, estimated tax payments are every three months, and when I owe taxes, I get a little nervous about it, so I just pay what I can with my credit limit. Are you self-employed? 
Yeah, I'm self-employed, and I got a part-time job just to cover personal expenses, other stuff, I guess, like food. Yeah, so, so you're making taxable income of $100,000 a year. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I mean, your quarterly estimates should be no more than a fourth of your net profit on your business. How much of the 100000 is net profit on your business? About 50000 of it, like half. And then the other half is your part-time job. Well, the part-time job is only about a fourth of the... Where's the other fourth coming from? Income. Well, so I've got uh, about 100000 coming from the business, and then only about 30000 coming from my part-time job. Okay. Net profit on the business is one hundred grand. No, net profit would be about fifty thousand. So that adds up to eighty, though. It would be your income. You said thirty from the part-time job, fifty from the business. So where's the other twenty mm-hmm. coming from? You don't have a hundred thousand dollar income. Going. You have an eighty thousand dollar income. No, yeah. So it's a, uh, over a hundred gross, not net. Yeah, bad. yeah. Okay. No gross revenues, not profit. Taxable household income is eighty. You make a fifty thousand dollar profit on your business and thirty on your side job. Am I missing something? No, that's correct. Okay, so the fifty thousand, when you make that money each month, you should be setting aside a fourth of that. So it's about uh, four thousand bucks a month. So you should be setting aside a thousand dollars a month for taxes out of your business, so you don't get behind on your taxes. Every time you make money in the business, you should set aside a fourth of it. Pretend profit. like it doesn't exist. And, and set it aside because then yeah. when you get ready to pay your quarterly estimates, you'll have the money to pay it. You're not budgeting in your business for taxes. And then when the taxes come due, you're borrowing them. Am I? Have I got that yeah. right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. You got to stop that. It's not working for you. Yeah, I try to put away at least 10%. No, it's it's 25 lately. Ten percent's not covering it. That's why you're coming up short. Yeah. Because you got both sides of FICA. You got fifteen three right there. Fifteen point three percent your self employment tax alone before you get to income tax, and then about another ten for your income tax on that. And so you're going to have a twenty five, a solid twenty five in your case. And so it's a it's a it's thousand bucks a month if you're making fifty grand. You got to set that aside because your quarterlies are going to be three. 3200 somewhere in that range when you do your quarterly estimates and you need to have the cash already in the account because you set the money aside knowing that bill was coming out of your profits. You're withholding on yourself. That's the way that works. And then that stops all the borrowing. The reason you're getting in a pinch is your cash flow system sucks. Right, right. And there is no try here. You saw I try to put just auto draft it to savings. Do whatever you have to do. Just never see that money. If you were working somebody making 50K, they would take it out of your check before they gave you any money. And then you would try to live on the rest. Not I tried to pay my taxes. So you got to do that to yourself is what I'm saying. Because the last thing you want to owe is the freaking KGB. I mean the IRS. They're the last people on the planet you want to be. You get you nervous, makes me nervous too. They got unlimited power and they charge a lot for ta- for penalties and interest. And Justin, you called asking how to get a house. I think right now we got to put pause on that while we clean up this debt, get an emergency fund in place, cut up the cards, close those accounts. Then we can start thinking about a down payment. Yeah, you got to get your, you got to get your debts cleaned up and get your system right to where you actually know what you've got to work with to, to start saving towards buying a house. So how much debt do you have? Currently, I just got out of debt after this past tax payment. I cleared the credit just using the business income. Good. Okay, so you cleaned up the, the credit. But I already now used that when, credit when's, card? Your next, when's your next quarterly estimate due? That would be after June, so I guess June 15th. Mm-hmm. And how much away. money set aside for that? Currently, almost a thousand. I'm still working on baby step number one. No, this is not a baby step. This, but saving for setting money aside out of your business for taxes is not a baby step. 
It's before you do anything with the money. Okay. Then you have baby steps with money that's left over. So I'd be selling stuff, working that part-time job, so you have four grand by the time those quarterly estimates are due. Yeah, you do not, you, and you just got 45 days, not even. You got 30-something 30, 30 days um, to, to, get, to get to the be ready for that estimate. So that's your main thing right now. Just take all your money out of your business and set aside for taxes so you don't get caught up. So, yep. Dave, this is a new entrepreneur. So what advice would you give to those who are going, Dave, I'm self-employed for the first time. I don't really know. No one taught me how to do this the right way. What are the first few things you tell them to do? Open a separate checking account for your business. All of the income for your business goes into that account. Only expenses for that business come out of that account. The difference that's in that account on cash basis accounting is profit. You know, in other words, revenue minus expenses equals profit. And that's what's going to show up in that checking account. If you don't do anything except business things in that account, then whatever's in that account at the end of the month, that's new money at the end of the month that wasn't there last month. Okay. And we, okay. Put an additional 2000 in this account net of expenses. That's profit. Then you need to set aside a fourth of that and open a little savings account over the side and set that over there. In his case, it's a thousand dollars a month. He needs to be setting a thousand. If he's making fifty profit, he needs to be setting aside a thousand dollars a month over in a separate savings account, not to be used for anything except the taxes that come up once a quarter. And you have to file quarterly estimates by your second year in business, or you get penalized for not filing, mm. much less not paying. So you don't get out of it by not filing, just like you don't get out of it by not filing your taxes. This is the Ramsey Show. Hey folks, you know that sinking feeling when you make an offer on a house you love and then you hear there's another offer? You need the Churchill Mortgage Home Buyer Edge. Super fast pre-approval and a secured interest rate. Plus a $5,000 seller guarantee gives your offer the best chance of being accepted. The Home Buyer Edge from Churchill gives you an advantage over those other guys. Go to churchillmortgage.com today to learn more. George Campbell, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. April is in Idaho Falls, Idaho. Hi, April. How are you? Hi, Dave. Hey, what's up? Um, so we actually live in beautiful Salmon, Idaho. It's a remote vacation um, destination. My husband and I have been remotely working for the last two years. We have $1.4 million, million in cash. Um, we owe 360000 on our house. My question is, we're officially debt-free if we pay that house off. Um, our jobs are kind of going away. So we can move back to a city, um, get stable jobs. I run a business in Boise, Idaho, and that business kind of needs my help or else it's gonna, it's gonna, I'm going to have to run it half of the year instead of the full year. My husband can get, get his really good job back, or we could buy a second home somewhere else and kind of do the snowbird lifestyle. My question is this. We have seven children, ages 19 to 6, and we did skip baby step number five. So how important is it that we keep our income higher, be more stable, support them through college, or do we kind of go for the dreamy the dreams, I guess, and trying to work on careers that we love and places we love to live. And the kids fend for themselves. Kind of. Just turn them loose. Well, no, but I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Part of our idea is going to Florida half a year, working there. My husband's a nurse. He can travel nurse. I can start another side gig 
or do mine half the year when we live in Idaho. They can go to school there. We can support them, I guess, with housing, but not as much with money. What's your current house worth with the mortgage on it? Um, 700000 Okay, and you owe about half of that. You could pay it off today. Um, yeah. But you're thinking about selling this and moving for work. No, we would, like, we would pay this. My number one option is to pay this house off, enhance it so it's more rentable because we can add things to it because it's a destination in the wilderness. And so we can add some more rental options to it and make money off of it while we're not here. And then we could buy a second home for cash in, like, Florida or Arizona, somewhere warm. Um, my husband can make pretty good money in nursing, travel nursing. And then I would probably get a seasonal side gig in the winter. And then in the summers, I would run my business in Boise half of the year. But it's kind of messy that way. That's kind of what I want to ask is. That sounds like em- that sounds like empty net. nesters. That doesn't sound like seven kids. Yeah, yeah, I know. We would probably net 200000 a year if we did the snowbird kind of lifestyle with our kids. And we would probably net four hundred thousand if we went back to the city and kept things stable. Could you do the four hundred thousand option until we get college taken care of and kind of get our financial situation in order? How old is the youngest? Six. No. <laughs> you could. We, um, we need like a ten-year plan. We're going to graduate four kids in five years. Um. I don't think there's a wrong answer unless it, unless you call me up later and say the children were forced to get student loans because they're not forced to do that. No, they're not. And they, I mean, our oldest kids did a lot of dual credit. Um, so they have two years done of school. Our younger kids are already working on dual credit. Yeah. Our youngest probably will go for scholarship. Can you cash flow their help. school with their help? And can they, with your help, cash flow their school if you do your snowbird option? We just make less that way. The other way would be... I know you make less. I said, can they get through college without debt if you do the snowboard op- snur- snowbird option? I think so. I do. I don't want to just dream this. I want to lay it out on paper. Mm, kid kid number like one is going to need X. Years. Kid number two is going to need Y. Kid number three is going to need Z. Kid number four is going to need A. Kid number five is going to need B. And we lay out the money. We look at it, and the kid's going to do this. They're going to get the credits. They're going to go. They're going to work. They're going to go to this school. It's going to cost. It's going to cost a certain amount of money. And here's how much we have. And we're going to tear into this million dollars in order to do this, uh, okay. with their in order to supplement what they can't cover, so they don't have student loans and what you can't cash flow because you did the snowbird option. If you can pull all that off, I'm fine with it. And you're going to haul them back and forth from Florida to Boise, right? Right. Okay. As long as you want to do all that, I'm good with it. But it kind of sounds like your snowbird thing is like as if you didn't have children or something. <laughs> I know. I mean, because cause when I said haul them back and forth, you went, eh, eh. Did you hear yourself? Yeah. I mean, the ones that live with us would have to go back and forth. The ones that are launching, which two of them are, you know, they can decide. Well, then we only got go. five to haul. Yeah. How old are you two? 46 and 47. I'll give you a medium plan halfway between okay. probably doesn't work though. It might work. I mean, you could go do the 400 for three years mm-hmm. and that would launch the vast majority of the kiddos. And then the snowbird wouldn't involve hauling as many children on its back. Right. That's what I was thinking. Maybe we just seen a little more time of being stable. Yeah. I mean, you can do either one. Sure. Uh, but part of the downside for me on your plan is hauling a whole truckload of kids back and forth twice a year because you're upsetting teenagers, social networks, and family mm-hmm. and everything else. You're resetting. Mm-hmm. 
I mean, Sharon and I, it's just us. We can run back and forth and stay wherever. And I mean, we don't, nobody cares particularly except grandkids griping about Mimi not being around. But other than that, I mean, there's no, we're not hauling people around. It's just me and her. We can go with a backpack and go. Uh, but you guys, you got a lot of stuff you're moving around, a lot of human beings you're moving around there. So it's just however you want to do it. But mathematically, be sure whatever plan you're going to do that you map it all the way out. Begin with the end in mind, as Stephen Covey said. And that's where I was thinking if she could use the 400000 income and quickly you know, front load a bunch of 529s for the young kids, cash flow the older ones, that can get, get them in a good spot. Yeah, do that for two or three years, not forever. Not then, necessarily till the six-year-old leaves. And the snowbird plan becomes maybe a five, seven-year well, plan. Well, not even. A, maybe a three or four. I mean, you could do it for three or four. They've already got a million bucks clear, plus a house clear. So, you know, approaching a $2 million net worth already. So well done, by the way, on yeah, that, April. Awesome. Well done. So I, I just want you to be really intentional and thoughtful and just map this out, the whole thing out, like it was a business plan. And, and you're, you know, you're estimating your cash needs and your cash sources. And my cash source is my income. My needs are tuition and travel and whatever else we're doing here. And do we do that on 200 and deplete the million? Or do we do that on 400 for three years and then we'd never touch the million? I like that pro plan probably, too. you know, something like that. Somewhere in there is your answer, but just run it, run it. Uh, accountants would call it a sources and uses. Okay. Where's, what's your income sources and what are your uses and map that out through the last kid getting through college, and then let's figure out which way we're going to go. And that'll give you an answer that feels it, it, that feels peaceful, uh, but just kind of going, well, I think I might. Well, no, that doesn't work. And the next family movie night, everyone watch Borrowed Future as a family because that will spark the conversations about how we're going to go to college debt-free, uh, and that'll get them moving. But I don't like the option of they all just figure it out and get, go get student loans. Yeah. We can do better than that. Turning loose seven kids feral is not a good plan. This is The Ramsey Show. Thanks for joining us, America. We're glad you're here. Open phones at 888-825-5225. If you've never been to one of our smart conferences, well, that's not smart. You need to go. You'd be smarter if you go. That's why we call them that. We'd love to have you. Hey, our next one's going to be in Chicago. The first time ever we've done a smart conference in Chicago. Smart conference weekend is going to be September 15 and 16. We'll be Friday night, all day Saturday. I'll be there with all of the Ramsey personalities, and we will be teaching you life hacks about money, relationships, boundaries, and, of course, with Ken Coleman, we'll be talking about work and careers. So a little bit of everything will be covered all day Saturday and then that Friday evening. It, uh, the early bird prices for general admissions only $79. We do have an exclusive dinner with me and the other personalities. Only a handful of people can come to this, and that's the Platinum Plus ticket. We also have Platinum and Gold tickets. We've got, you know, up front. we got book signings. we got all kinds of stuff built into this that you can do. $79 your minimum entry, and that'll get you in the door, and that's definitely worth it. Oh, my gosh, you'd pay a Two hundred seventy-nine to hear any one of these speakers and best-selling authors at another location. So, uh, make sure you're planning to come again. Chicago, great weekend to make it. September 
15 and 16 and tickets are on sale right now at ramseysolutions.com slash events amanda's next in salt lake city hi amanda welcome to the ramsey show hi thank you so much for having me sure what's up um yeah so about five years ago we bought our first house and we based the location um based on where we were working at the time obviously things have changed in the past few years um i started a job last year that i really love and it was remote Um, and my husband still works remotely but a couple months ago they required us to start coming back into the office um i love the job it has helped us in a lot of ways financially as well, not just because of the pay, but they have a subsidized daycare for um, the kids of employees. So we bring our kids there. They serve breakfast and lunch at the office and at daycare. So we're saving on our food bill every month. But my commute is about two hours round trip, depending on traffic. Yeah. So, um, and that's with the kids because the daycare is right across the street from the office. Um, So what we're wondering is, should we, sell our house right now and try to move closer i do want to be at this job long term or should we move out and rent the house and just rent closer um to the office we're just trying to figure out a, the you said your husband's remote yeah he's remote he's looking for another job right now and might come to work where i work because he sees how much i love it but might work remotely not sure but currently remote yeah, well, you're, I don't know that I would keep yours as a rental and go rent for a while because you plan on being there long term, right? Yeah. No. So I think it's just time to move. Yeah, just sell your house. You love the, you like the just community that the, the workplace is in. Um. Yeah, it's in a a nice area. Um. Can you afford it? Yeah. Is the housing market much different? Um, not a ton different. We just here um, in where we are, house prices have gone up a lot, which is good and bad. Good because we have some equity, and so if we sold, we'd have a nice chunk of change for a down payment. Um, but it also is bad because things are a lot more expensive than when we bought five years ago. That's okay. What would your house sell for today? About four forty-four. Okay, go buy a house for four fifty in the other place. Sell your house. Okay. Even swap, and you're just down the street. No two-hour commutes. Anything wrong with that plan? Um, I guess just we kind of don't want to go through the hassle of moving. Um, Nobody does. I don't want to go through the hassle of driving two hours. Yeah, that's I mean, true. after about it's two also, days, I'm moving. Yeah. I don't know how you're doing hard it. hard to find. I know. I know. Well, I listen to your show, even though my toddler says, I don't want to. Um, Well, I appreciate that um, you get two hours of us, but I still would move. Yeah. Like tomorrow. The the tricky thing is things that are 450. um, Your house is 450. And you told us the house prices were similar. Your house sells yeah. for 450. Go buy another 450. Don't use this as an excuse to screw up your life and buy us 850. You can't afford 850. Go buy 450. You live in 450 now, same house prices. Okay, sounds good. You can do this. You Thank can do you. this and yeah, and, and just it's going to cost you a little bit to move, but you're going to get a quality of life. 4 freaking hours a day. I, I mean, what's that worth? A lot. Yeah. And go jump on RamseySolutions.com, get connected with one of our real estate ELPs, endorsed local providers who can help you with this, and also check out our friends at Pods Moving and Storage for this move to make it smoother. Yeah, both those things will really help make the process easier for sure. Take the headache out. Yeah, but I am I mean, if you come up $10,000 short when you're done with this whole thing, so would he. You know, you're just debt-free, you're making the move, you got a great job, you like the place, your husband likes the place, you like the community, make the move. Make the move. And if you don't want to buy right now, sell yours and go rent over there until you're ready to buy over there. But don't rent for five years and think the house prices are going to come down. No, they're not. They're going up. So remember five years ago when your house? Yeah, I remember. Okay. Brandon is in Atlanta, Georgia. Hey, Brandon, welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, Dave, I appreciate you taking my call. Um, So I get to the point. My wife and I are... um, saving for a house. We have about $33,000 saved currently. Um, 
However, our family is growing. Uh, we have two kids, um, a dog, and we have a kid on the way as well during November. Um, and we want to, well, we think uh, we need to get a new car to accommodate um, our family. And was just wondering. You mean a different you car? About, correct, a different car. What, so what, car, what do you correct, got now? Correct. What kind of cars you got now? So I have a 2000 Honda. It's, it needs a lot of work. I'm honestly not really driving it. I have a, a drive a work truck to work, um, and my wife drives a 2013 Sentra. And we just feel like we need something bigger. What will the Sentra the sell for? Uh, my guess is maybe five or six thousand. Yeah, sounds right. What would the Honda sell for? Oh man, maybe a thousand. No, about three. About three. I mean, because it needs a transmission. Oh well, not um, not in that case. Okay. All right, I'm going. I'm going with your thousand then. Okay, so we got six or seven thousand dollars worth of cars that we're going to sell, and we're going to take seven thousand dollars. Do you have any money? Oh, you got thirty three thousand for a down payment on a house. Yeah, we have we have a twelve thousand dollar emergency fund. We have thirty three on the house. So we were thinking maybe taking some of that house fund and reallocating it. And just wanted to hear your perspective on if you think that's an okay idea or. What's your household uh, income? Uh, together this year, we'll probably do about one forty gross. And what are you thinking about spending um, on a car? You got seven uh, from cars. Yeah, I mean, from what we've been looking at, I don't know if we kind of overshooting. We, we we feel like we need a third row, and you know, so we've been looking at maybe three kids or less. They each need a row. Three kids and a you know, and a, we have a dog as well. The dog goes everywhere in the car. Not everywhere. Well, no. good God, you don't buy a dog. You don't buy a car for a dog, dude. Okay. Okay. So what'd you do? What you you come up to thirty grand now on the car? Well, no, twenty twenty or less. Yeah. Three yeah, way less. Thinking. Hey, every dollar you spend on this stupid car is going down in value through the toilet. Every dollar you spend on this house is going to go up in value. Right. And better for your family long term. So I, I'm going to minimize this car. I'm going to take 7000 put a little bit with it. Let's call it max of 15 That still leaves you 25 for a down payment on your house. Don't screw up your house deal by buying a car for the dog. It's going to slow down the savings goal. And so that's the part that's going right. to hurt if you drop a whole lot of money on this car. Oh. Right. There's a balance there. Okay. These dogs are getting expensive. Listen, we've thought about it, Dave. The third you, row for if, the dogs. If you buy it, if you buy it, I'll kill you, George. You're already pet ramping. Listen, oh we returned God. the pet ramp, Dave. The you saga's did? over. Yeah. Oh, I'm so no disappointed. Pet ramps. I, we taught our dog how to jump. One fewer things to uh, make fun of George on. This is the Ramsey Show. Scripture of the day, Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Andy Andrews says, life itself is a privilege, but to live life to the fullest, that is a choice. George Camel, Ramsey personality, YouTube star of the George Camel wow. YouTube show is my co-host today. John is with us. John is in New York City. Hi, John. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. George and Dave, what a pleasure to speak to you both. You too, sir. Um, What's up? Thank you. So I have a question, and then I'll give you the rundown behind it. Um, so um, I'm currently employed. I'm happy at my job. I'm getting opportunities to uh, make pretty nice chunk of change more um, in uh, other jobs. That's pretty much a similar, similar position. Um, so I'm currently 28 years old. I have about 40,000 in savings. Um, I'm debt free. Thanks to following all your principles for many years. Um, I rent and um, 
90k base salary right now, um, and I have a good margin um, after you know each month. And I'm just you know I'm so I'm living comfortable per se, uh, a little high cost of living living area. Um, so I'm just wondering. I'm getting all these opportunities to go to jobs that I can make about maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars more, and I just don't know what to do because I I have a you know pretty nice culture where I'm at now, but it's very tempting, you know. So I'm looking for your. What are these other jobs? Do you think you'd be miserable in them? Are the people toxic? I mean, is it worth the thirty yeah, k no. jump, or is it? Hey, these are good people too. Um, good company. Yeah, it seems like it's going to be a. Uh, an okay jump if I were to. I I stayed at one company for three years um, and then this one for two years. So I don't necessarily like being a job hopper. That's not but, the point. Um, the point yeah. is, are you drop, are you jumping into a toxic mess? Um, doesn't seem like it. I've, I've been in the industry for five years and I know a lot of the manufacturers. I'm a, pretty much a salesman for uh, uh, building materials. Um, so, That's a similar role? Uh, yeah, similar role. And it's where you want to go long term in your career. Yeah, yeah, I'm very comfortable in this career. Uh, made tons of relationships, and it's. Uh, I mean, the premise rewarding. of your question is is that the culture is not as good at the other place. If the culture is as good as your place, and it's thirty thousand dollars more, why would you not do that? I don't know. It's just uh, you know keeping keeping. Um, you know, I, I put so much effort into my current position. I built a lot of relationships. Uh, over the past two years, and uh, you know, it took a while to to build a lot of trust with um, some customers and everything. Um, so, are you going like, to start over? Um, I won't have the same customer base, uh, but you know, it's the same title and everything. So, going, you know, calling on a similar industry um, professionals, but not so ride an existing base. customer base or go get a new one for thirty k more. And that's assuming mm-hmm. that the environment, the culture is as good. Is this the proposal? Yeah. 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 And that's, yeah, uh, assuming there. So the only so, strain uh, is you starting uh, and having to do some scratching and clawing. Yes. And one thing I want to mention as well, uh, if you don't mind, um, what do you think about should I mention it to my employers now and? I don't know if I can receive a counteroffer in any way, or uh, is there a way to approach that situation? Well, I I think we need to go back to first, are you going to leave? Okay. Okay, because if you're going to go over to to a toxic company and you have Mm -hmm. to scratch and claw, no, I wouldn't do that for 30K. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go do that. But if you can find a company Mm -hmm. where the relationships, the quality of humans, the value system is as appealing as where you are and you can make 30 K and the only thing you got to do is do a little bit of heavy lifting for the first two years. No whining, go do it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and yeah. so now if that's the case, then let's go to your other question. And the best way to think about how to do business ethics or conversations with leaders is switch roles in your mind. Let's say you owned a building materials company and you had a great sales guy on your team that you really liked. And another place offered him 30 K more. What would you want him to do? <laughs> Me personally? Yeah, I would, I would say maybe let's find a happy medium here. Uh, well, I would, I would, first I would love the opportunity if you're the employer to know it and say, Hey, these yeah. guys came in, I, you know, they call me they're they're offering 30 K more. And I'm not in here trying to hold you up or anything. I'm not trying to blackmail you. I just wanted to give you this information because I like being here. Um, how how do you think we can work through this? If you told a leader that, they're not going to be angry. They're going to go, uh, we can't pay you that. You should go. Or they're going to go, well, crud, yeah. I mean, we I don't know if we can get you to 30 today, but we can probably get you 20 and get you another 10 if you did these three things or something like that, right? Right. But if they yeah, don't, that, if they that, value really keeping point. you, they would value the information that you might be leaving. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. And so um, it's just, okay. but the big yeah. thing is don't go in. This is not a swagger. This is just right. gentle. Right. This is not cocky. This is like, hey, right. I, these other guys, and I like it here, and I like you. And I like, you know, I like my customer base. I like what I'm doing. 
Uh, but 30 K, I mean, what would you tell me to do if you were my friend, yeah. you know, ask the leader of that, yeah. right. And go, yeah. I just thought you'd want this information and let, I don't know, let's talk about what, how do we work through this together? Cause I like being here. And instead Good of like, thing. you got to give me 30 or better, or you've got to match or it or out. I'm out the door. I would tell <laughs> yeah. you to hit the door. Sure. You'd, exactly. you'd fire. If that was you, you'd fire somebody for that. I would too. Oh. I'm not going to be blackmailed. Yep. But I love information on people I love and that they've got opportunity. And if I can't match it as the employer that, I, you know, I care about my people, then I'll just say, we don't, we can't pay that here. It doesn't make sense to us. So, man, I'm sorry, but I, I hate to lose you, but good luck with that. I hope it works out for you. And I'll just set you free, right. you know. Right, right. That's why, you know, uh, you know, then I would be prepared to, you know, leave. So that's why. Yeah, you yeah, got to have in your mind that that's why I solved the problem first. Yeah. You got to be emotionally ready for them to go. Sorry, we can't. And then you go, all right. Yeah. I guess I'm out. Yeah. That, so I think your leader is probably going to step up and get you somewhere heading in that direction if you have this conversation gently and humbly. I think that's going to happen. Sarah's in San Francisco. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Hi, Dave. Good. How are you doing? Better than I deserve. We're a little short on the clock. Can you go fast? I will. Um, one of my dreams is to buy a house large enough that would take in my parents. Um, they don't have any retirement, and it's been, um, again, one of my dreams, and it's an honor to take them back in. And just trying to decide if this is the right time for me to make that move and buy that larger home. Are you uh, renting right now? No, I have a home right now. How old are they? Um, my parents are 72 and 82. And what does this involve? You're, sell you're selling the house you're in, which so sells for what? So right now, my house would sell for about $1.7 and I owe about 600000 on it. Okay. And you would move up to what? I would move up to $2.5 So $800,000 increase. Okay. Yes. That's pretty generous. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you could pay a lot of rent for them in an apartment. For eight hundred grand. Yeah, I don't think um, I need to be close by to just for caretaking reasons as well. Yeah. Okay. So where's the eight hundred grand going to come from? So I have liquid of a million right now. Um, All right, do it. It. Do it. Yeah. Okay. It's what you want to do with your money. You're a multi-millionaire. Yeah. You got about a million of equity plus your million cash. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank pay, you. pay cash for the move and do it. Don't buy a house that is a bad house uh, that's a bad mother-in-law apartment, okay? Meaning that when you get ready to sell it after they're gone someday, that your house is weird. Don't buy a weird house. Just buy a big enough house that they've got a place to stay, and then when they're gone, the house is not a weird house. That puts the Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Hey, it's George Camel. If you like what you heard in this episode and want to know more about getting started on the Ramsey Baby Steps, go to RamseySolutions.com and click on the Get Started button. We'll help you figure out the best next step for you based on your specific situation. That's RamseySolutions.com and click Get Started.